Hi, I'm Council Member Will Jawando from the great state of Maryland. And it's my honor to welcome you to the 10th annual convening of the New Deal Leaders. This is a great organization because it's a place that we come together to share progressive pro-growth ideas, to support each other, but also to hold each other accountable. And what an opportunity we have right now with the Biden administration coming in to help our country build back better, to come out of the worst pandemic in our lifetimes and make sure that everyone has an opportunity to succeed. That's what this conference is about. That's what the New Deal leaders are about. And the policies and the conversations that we're gonna have this week are gonna help us do that. So thank you for coming and enjoy. I'm a New Deal leader. I'm Brooke Learman, a state delegate representing District 46, Baltimore City in the Maryland House of Delegates. Hi, I'm Jack Schneerman. I'm the controller in Nassau County, New York. I'm Amir Faroki, city council member in Atlanta, Georgia. Sean Scanlon, State Representative, Guilford, Connecticut. My name is Mari Manugian. I'm the State Representative in the 40th House District here in Birmingham, Michigan. Hi, I'm Ryan Coonerty. I'm a 3rd District County Supervisor in Santa Cruz, California, and I'm a New Deal Leader. And I'm a New Deal Leader. I'm a New Deal Leader. I'm a New Deal Leader. I'm proud to be a New Deal Leader. And I'm a New Deal Leader. Hi, I'm State Senator Carrie Donovan, and I represent the High Mountains of Colorado. I'm proud to be a New Deal Leader because it lets me help my community by letting me talk to some of the smartest people in the country about the next big idea. And what a better time to do that than now with the Biden administration ready to lead us forward to a brighter future, where we can talk about progressive, pro-growth ideas to improve the country and our communities. I'm proud to be a New Deal leader. Hi, I'm Dr. Dorcia Pleers, Chief City Auditor in Albany, New York, Hi, I'm Dave Ehrenberg, State Attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida. My name is Josh Maxwell. I'm Vice Chair of the Board of Commissioners in Chester County, Pennsylvania. This is Luke Fizard from the Middleton City Council in the great state of Wisconsin. My name is Erica Strasberger. I'm a member of Pittsburgh City Council. I am Montgomery County, Maryland County Council Member Hans Reamer, and I'm a New Deal leader. I'm a New Deal leader. I'm a New Deal leader. I am a New Deal leader. I am a New Deal leader. And I am a New Deal leader. Hi, I'm Tashara Jones and I'm the treasurer of the city of St. Louis. I've been a member of the New Deal since 2009 and I am both honored and humbled to be a member of such a wonderful organization. The New Deal has given me more than I can ever give it. We as leaders get to come from all across the country and share ideas with each other. Some I have even brought home to my community. I'm proud to be a New Deal leader. Hi, I'm Marco Leas, Majority Floor Leader of the Washington State Senate. I'm Nima Kulkarni. I'm a state representative for District 40 in Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, I'm Chris Hansen. I represent Southeast Denver in the Colorado State Senate. I am Laura Register, formerly on the Grady County Board of Education in Cairo, Georgia. I'm David Buckwald. I'm a member of the New York State Assembly. Hi, greetings from Princeton, New Jersey. I'm Liz Lempert, Mayor of Princeton, and very proud to be a New Deal leader. I'm 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 a New Deal leader. And I'm a New Deal leader. Hi, I'm Zach Conan, the treasurer from the great state of Nevada. The incoming Biden-Harris administration gives us the opportunity to make real change in our communities, make our states even better. The New Deal has been a constant source of collaboration and innovation and best practices, and I'm proud to learn and serve with this group. I'm grateful, and I'm a New Deal leader. Hi, my name is Derek Green, an at-large city council member from the great city of Philadelphia. I'm St. Petersburg Mayor Rick Reisman. I'm Rob Werner, city councilor from Concord, New Hampshire. Hi, my name is Molly Cowan. I am the vice chair of the Exeter Select Board in New Hampshire. I'm State Senator Barry Feingold, and I represent the communities of Andover, Lawrence, Tewksbury, and Drakett in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Bob Duff, State Senator from Connecticut and the Senate Majority Leader, and I'm a New Deal Leader. And I'm very proud to be a New Deal Leader. I'm a New Deal Leader. And I'm a New Deal Leader. I'm a New Deal Leader. And I am a New Deal Leader. I'm Anna Tovar, Mayor of the City of Tolleson in Arizona, and soon to be Arizona Corporation Commissioner. When I started with New Deal, I was serving in the state legislature in the super minority. And boy, did New Deal come at the right time for me. It provided me with that inspiration and hope of all the solutions that existed all across the nation by very great New Deal leaders. It also inspired me to run statewide. 
and I'm proud to announce that I'm going to be the first ever Latina to serve the state of Arizona. I couldn't have done it without New Deal. And now it gives me great honor and privilege to introduce our CEO and host and fearless leader, Debbie Cox Bolton. And I'm a New Deal leader. Thank you so much, Anna, and to all the amazing and inspiring New Deal leaders that were in that video. While we can't be together in person this year, seeing all of you makes me so happy and gives me so much hope for the future. I'm Debbie Cox Bolton, CEO of the New Deal. And again, I want to welcome you to the 10th annual New Deal Leaders Conference. Thank you for being with us to help celebrate that amazing milestone in these extraordinary times. This year's gathering, though virtual, could not be more timely nor more important. We come together filled with relief that a dark chapter in our country's history is coming to an end and with hope that there's a new day dawning. We also come together knowing that this election was only the beginning. We have so much important work to do. The challenges we face are big and they're urgent. Combating the virus and turning the economy around, addressing climate change, stamping out systemic racism, renewing democracy, and replacing a politics of demonization and division with one of compassion and common purpose. Electing Joe Biden and Kamala Harris was the first critical step in turning things around. And it's gonna take every single one of us working as hard as we can to unite and rebuild our country. New Deal leaders, exceptional state and local elected officials like the ones you saw tonight across the country will be critical to helping the Biden-Harris administration build back better. Those leaders are on the front lines of so many of the challenges that we face, and they're developing solutions and innovations to meet the moment, many of which we'll be talking about over the next three days. We're so excited to get to work with the new administration as true partners to solve problems and heal communities. We kick off our, kick off our conference tonight with an amazing group of people, New Deal leaders and partners of the network. Later, we'll hear from Congresswoman Susan Delbene, a New Deal alum, Congresswoman-elect Marilyn Strickland, about our partnership with the New Democrat Coalition. We'll hear from New Deal leader, Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who's been so instrumental in defending democracy, and from our dear friend, Senator Chris Coons, New Deal Vice Chair, about restoring America's leadership in the world. But I am absolutely thrilled tonight to start with a New Deal leader who really needs no introduction, but who deserves a great one. While it's been no surprise to those of us who've gotten to know him since he joined the New Deal way back in 2012, Mayor Pete Buttigieg has emerged as one of the most important democratic voices of his generation and frankly, for our whole country. Throughout the campaign, Pete offered and continues to offer a clear vision forward grounded in our shared values, starting with the urgent task of rebuilding trust in America and in each other. So it is my great honor to welcome home to the New Deal Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Well, thanks so much, Debbie. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that I know you've got a birthday coming up and uh, we would uh, all be, we're all raising a glass virtually uh, if we can't uh, celebrate with you in person, but uh, happy upcoming birthday and congratulations to you and Helen on and the entire New Deal team and all of your supporters. It's amazing to think what you've built over 10 years. I got my start in elected office just a little bit after New Deal did. And to see what you've been able to do, especially in terms of the bang to buck ratio uh, in creating a community of like-minded public problem solvers has been really incredible. Uh, I, I often, uh, it, it almost became part of my mental uh, calendar for that season between Thanksgiving and, and and Christmas to always look forward to that gathering in, in early December. And uh, I, I know it's virtual this time, but that'll just make it that much sweeter when we can get together in person next year. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm really honored that you invited me to be part of, of this kickoff because this really is an extraordinary group. You know, when, when you're uh, in elected office, you are beset with invitations to all kinds of extracurriculars, as I would call them. And, and um, you know, especially in times when we're normally traveling and convening, they could literally consume all of your uh, all of your time, all of your weeks and weekends. And so you wind up realizing you got to be selective about which organizations and groups you participate in. But one of the reasons New Deal uh, went to and stayed at the top of my list during my time as mayor was that I knew 
knew that every time I attended a session, a seminar, a, a conference, I would walk away with my head full of new ideas and often a little notepad uh, full of new ideas to the sometimes consternation of my staff who I would inflict them on in a, a breathless readout the first uh, uh, meeting after we had come together because people in this community are firing with such important and exciting ideas. And I think that's gonna be more important than ever as will the, the trusted community and the national network of support uh, and the just plain good spirit and goodwill of the people who are in this community. I think it's going to be really important for American political leadership going into the 2020s. And I use the term 2020s very intentionally because I think we've been so focused on 2020, which admittedly has felt like a decade uh, on its own, uh, and the, the, the huge stakes of just what it took to get through this year. But I'm convinced more than ever that the 2020s will be a deciding decade for the life of our country. So many of the issues that we've been talking about, worrying about, working on for the whole of our lifetimes are coming to a head in this decade. And I believe that we will either conquer them or they will conquer us. And in that sense, the fate of the American project and the balance of the 21st century, I think very much depends on these next few years. Getting the right person in the White House was a huge part of setting us up for success in the 2020s, but honestly, only the beginning. As Debbie aptly mentioned during her introduction, we face so many overlapping crises, uh, a climate crisis, a crisis in racial justice, an economic emergency, the pandemic, of course, and a level of, of, of crisis in the legitimacy of our democracy itself that needs to be addressed and repaired very quickly. I also believe, and I've, I've argued in a new book, that we face a threefold crisis of trust that interacts with all of these problems. Uh, an emergency low level of trust in government, an emergency low level of trust in one another, social trust, just the belief that we can trust one another to do the right thing, and collapsing levels of global trust in the United States itself, something I know that, that Senator Coons, who's become a, a great friend who I first got to know through New Deal, is going to speak about a, a little bit later this evening. And you know, I haven't given up on the chance for us to have uh, a trifecta, House, Senate, and White House. But whether we have divided government or whether we have the slimmest of Senate majorities, what we know is that so much will depend on creativity and so much will depend on the state and local level at which so many of the people on this call work. The truth is our American system is always encoded in state and local government, the greatest lat latitude, and in many respects, the greatest power to get things done. Uh, I don't think that's only something for us uh, who are uh, on our side of the aisle to think about just when there's a hostile White House, although that's certainly compelled us to be creative about what we do at the state and local level. But I also think it's even more true when you have a friendly White House that is seeking to do the right thing, but frankly can't solve these problems out of Washington, shouldn't be expected to. We should in many ways be taking the lead from the bottom up and then inviting federal leadership to uh, meet in the middle and, and help reinforce and amplify and circulate the good ideas that are coming up locally. And recycling what we've already done isn't going to be enough. This is also a moment that calls for enormous creativity. I, I often tell my students, undergraduates uh, here at the University of Notre Dame, who've been robbed of so many of the normal uh, experiences of college life, although miraculously uh, they've been able to have an in-person uh, semester uh, this fall. But I, I often remind them that for all of the things that they unfairly are going through, that circumstance and history have, uh, have forced on them, the other side of the coin is they know that they're going to be a consequential generation. And I think that's even more true for everybody who is alive and American and in a position of authority or problem solving at this moment. We're, we're at one of those moments. We've got the good and bad luck to be at one of those moments. Uh, that's really going to decide a lot of other things. A friend of mine put it to it this way, uh, that this is sort of the universe punishing anybody in our generation who told anyone in our parents' generation that we were jealous of them uh, over the excitement of the 60s. Uh, future generations will remember the 2020s in a way that might seem romantic and exciting eventually but is uh, certain to feel frustrating and painful and uncertain while we're living in it. And yet the thing I keep coming back to is that there is an American majority for the things we believe in, a healthy American majority of Democrats and independents and even quite a few Republicans. 
who believe in higher wages for workers, who believe in making sure that we actually do something about issues like gun violence, who believe that government can and should be asked and expected to do a better job of solving problems, uh, who believe that climate change is real, that we should address scientific and medical questions by paying attention to what scientists and doctors have to say on issue after issue, even issues where we've been on the back foot uh, in political life in the last 10 or 20 years. There is a majority of the American people ready to back us up and get it done. Now, that hasn't always worked out to a majority on Capitol Hill, which is why so much, I think, is going to depend on us actually finding solutions at that state and local level and delivering. One of the things I found in my research on the subject of trust is that there are both vicious and virtuous cycles of trust. And a vicious cycle of trust happens when there's low trust in the problem-solving capability of government. Expectations are low, therefore support is low, therefore resources are low, therefore results are poor, reinforcing the lack of trust. The reverse is also true. When you deliver for somebody, you get a little bit of a longer leash to be creative and imaginative in trying to deliver even further going forward. And it is, again, at that state and local level that there is more of that basic capital, that down payment of trust to work with that can lead to problem solving. And now that we will have a better administration, interface with the pulleys and levers that are being operated in Washington to actually get stuff done. That's what I think we have to do. Engage an American majority that already stands with us on the most important issues, but find ways to deliver irrespective of the political obstacles that have been created by the paralysis in Washington and demonstrate wherever we can what real problem solving actually looks like so that we gain that much more oxygen to do more creative things on the road ahead. And I know that you're at the forefront of that. And I know that uh, the coming days of this convening will be as uh, fruitful as any that we've had in the last 10 years to help circulate some of those ideas, pose the most important questions, maybe more important, uh, most important of all, gather up the social capital of that kind of trust that we all have as a community of people working these issues to call one another up, to bounce ideas off of each other, uh, to give each other a little bit of cover, uh, to uh, support each other trying new things, and uh, to come back to those we serve with a track record that'll give us that much more room for maneuver in the future. That's why I think New Deal is so important. That's why I'm excited to be with you. Thanks so much, Pete. It's so good to have you. And uh, just hearing all that just gives me, again, reminds me of uh, the work we have ahead of us, but a lot of hope that we can do it together. So thank you so much. We have a handful, um, three actually, uh, New Deal leaders uh, on hand uh, to ask you some questions. We appreciate you uh, being willing to, to talk with them. Let's start with um, Maryland Senator Will Smith. Hey, thanks. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor Pete. It's good to see you. And uh, good evening to every, all the, uh, the New Dealers out there, to our, our New Dealer family. Um, yeah, look, I think we're about the same age, and I just want to say that it was really inspirational to see you out on the campaign trail. Um, your message really resonated with all of us, and I just want to say thank you for, for getting out there and for your service, not only in the military, but as mayor and then also as a presidential candidate. And so just thank you for that up top. Um, so we're both veterans. Uh, we both served in Afghanistan, in Kabul, did essentially the same job. And so my question to you tonight is, how do you think that service in the military and then also in the civilian uh, sphere uh, could and has and will play a role in rebuilding civil society, especially as we move into a new administration in a couple of months here? Yeah, well, first of all, it's great seeing you and thanks for your leadership in, in Maryland and, and thanks for your voice, because I do think generational voices of people who served as you have, especially because of your track record of both civilian and military service, are what, what we need a lot more of now. You know, to me, that this really connects with what I was saying earlier about the issue of trust. And one of the things I, I always reflect on uh, is, you know, there were people when I when I was serving that I got to know over time. And the more I knew of their character and they knew of mine, uh, the more I knew this is somebody I want in the vehicle sitting next to me when we go outside the wire. And there was a remarkable depth of trust that was created there. But the really remarkable thing is the trust that somebody would have in me and I and them when we got into a vehicle for the first time. And I didn't know them at all. All I knew about them was the flag on their shoulder. And we might, uh, as we got to know each other, discover that we were from different parts of the country and had different politics. Boy, do we have different politics than some of the people we serve with, right? Uh, and might have uh, religious and racial and any number of other differences. 
But even though we had nothing in common but the flag on our shoulder, that was enough, that and this common project, to form an almost ridiculous level of trust, trusting each other with our lives, for the simple reason that we had to. And to me, that's kind of a metaphor for where America is right now. A lot of people with not much in common besides membership in the American project itself, who now depend on each other for our lives. And if anything has ever illustrated the extent of our interdependence, it is the pandemic, where each of our lives depends on the actions of others that we may not even meet. And I think in that sense, service is a metaphor. But I think in another sense, sorry, you might be hearing a little uh, interjection from, from the dog here. I think in another sense, service is also a big part of the solution. And, you know, uh, you and I got to know a, a level of, of, of social connection and trust form building and, and bond forming uh, while deployed, but you shouldn't have to go to war in order to get it. And as you know from your AmeriCorps experience, and as so many who have served, whether it's in the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps uh, or in some other way, um, just that experience of a shared, difficult project done by uh, people who are thrown together for a purpose can create the kind of connective tissue that we need so much more of as a country. I'm very worried that the, the circles of belonging that we live in, uh, a neighborhood, a profession, a church, a political affiliation, that used to be overlapping, have now become concentric circles. In other words, if you know something about my religion or my neighborhood, you probably all know, also know something about my profession or my politics. And so we need to really seek out and cultivate anything that cuts across that. Uh, that's our best shot at being able to see each other and hear each other in a way that, that beats back misinformation through some ability to appeal to common experience and remind one another we have a common reality. And that's one of the reasons, and you should definitely engage Senator Coons on this later this evening because he's got a pending legislation that would do just this. We could put so much more funding just into the pipeline that already exists uh, to beef up already authorized programs that would create way more of an opportunity for service. And I know that the incoming administration is going to be friendly to this. But this is also a great example, right, of how much this cashes out at a state and local level. As you know, it's a state-level service commission that, that handles uh, even the federal dollars and what that drives. And, you know, one of my favorite experiences as mayor was, was swearing in VISTA as an AmeriCorps volunteer. A lot of times the actual decision about where we need that work to be done needs to be made by local leaders. And so it's a classic example of a healthy intergovernmental partnership that we could do so much more with. And for the sake of our social fabric, I hope that we will. Thanks so much, Senator. Let me turn now to Senate leader, uh, Connecticut Senate leader, Bob Duff. Bob, can you hear me? Hey, uh, yeah, I can hear you, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Great. Thank you, and uh, thanks, Debbie, and uh, Pete, it's great to uh, see you. Thanks for being such a great um, friend uh, to New Deal and friend to all of us and such a great leader. You're so inspirational um, and really helped put New Deal on the map. And, you know, frankly, uh, during a presidential run, you really inspired a lot of people to come out and to vote and to uh, be a part of the political process, which I, which I know is part of what we're all trying to do. We're trying to inspire the next generation into public service, and you've done a great job of that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that, you know, you're such such a great communicator. And uh, during uh, the last few months, you were just an awesome campaign surrogate and spent a lot of time on a place like Fox News, where many times Democrats don't spend uh, a lot of time on, but talking to voters who may not agree with you on many things. Um, what advice do you have for leaders as we seek to unite this country about how to speak to people who don't agree with you and how to find common ground? We've got to bring ourselves together. We agree on a lot of things. Sometimes the messaging is a little different, but you know, how did how did you do that and how do we find that common ground? Yeah, first of all, thanks for your your friendship and encouragement and support uh, through the years. And uh, and thanks for the question because I think it's so central to what we've got to uh, do, frankly, a better job of right now. Um, I never would have guessed that going on Fox News would become a specialty of mine. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't have guessed when I first ran for president that our specialty in terms of where we did best in a place like Iowa would be in those counties that had uh, voted for President Obama and then voted for Donald Trump. Uh, what I found is that you can't blame somebody for not understanding your perspective if they've literally never heard it. And there's a lot of that right now. It's happening because of the polarization of our media ecosystem, but also the polarization of our daily lives. 
And uh, as you know, in, in state and local leadership, you, you don't really get to just hang out in your corner, your media bubble or, or your uh, circle of like-minded, ideologically aligned allies. It's much harder to preserve that at the national level. And it's why I think anytime you get a chance to break through the walls of, of one of these uh, echo chambers, you've got to do it. Even if, uh, as I feel when I go on Fox News, even if you have no illusions about the good faith of, of, of some of the folks on the opinion side or, 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 or even the kind of overall tilt to the network itself. Because even though the people on there might not always be in good faith, the people watching are. They're watching in good faith. And we have to acknowledge that a lot of uh, political views that 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 we would consider abhorrent aren't the result of some character flaw. They're the result of somebody uh, with a certain set of information or, or misinformation coming to them that if you or I had only that information, we might view things the same way too. And so it's our job to, to, to widen the access to information. But the other thing I've learned is this doesn't have to involve watering down our values. It's not always a question of policy compromise. Often reaching out to others is simply a matter of uh, showing them that they are regarded and vice versa, allowing for the possibility that you might be wrong about something, but also in areas where you're sure you're right, uh, believing that somebody could be invited to acknowledge uh, perhaps convert, perhaps not, but but at least acknowledge and understand your perspective and that you came by it honestly. And as we lose spaces for that engagement because of what our media environment has done, I actually think that the civic spaces that we kind of curate, uh, the, the, the kind of convening power that every uh, state legislator, every statewide elected official, every mayor, every city council member already has, is something that's only grown more important and wielding that in a way that creates those shared conversations where if we disagree because our values lead us in a different direction, fine. If we disagree because we weigh the different interests at stake differently, fine. But we've got to at least be doing it on the same field of fact. We've got to at least be invoking elements of the same reality when we're presenting our arguments for the differences uh, that, that we have and that we care about. And that's where I think we've, we've been in trouble. We also just got to show up, right? I think one issue is that we have uh, sometimes, I think we did a much better job of it this year, but we have as a party sometimes just literally written off parts of uh, the country. You know, my state had a Democratic senator not that long ago who probably lost 70 to 80 of our counties. Uh, uh, but uh, when he won, it was because he campaigned in those counties and made sure that it was 60-40 instead of 80-20, so that the rest of the the, the counties where, where a lot of people lived could put him over the top. And we shouldn't be afraid to reach out and engage everywhere. And when we do, by the way, it also helps us refine our own vocabulary uh, for uh, both for winning and for governing. It's one of the reasons why uh, among the congressional delegation and a lot of our partners in the New Dem coalition are part of this, um, you know, really listening to what the frontline freshmen or not even the freshman members now, but those frontline members have to say, I think is especially important because they have the fact that they're here <laughs> means that they've worked out ways to convey what we believe in uh, to communities that aren't used to hearing from us at all or aren't used to hearing a very persuasive message from us. And uh, the last thing I'll say that I think is going to be so important that, again, is, is not going to be foreign to you, uh, knowing your leadership on things like small business or to any uh, uh, local government leaders on the call, is you got to deliver. You deliver results, you get a little bit more trust, even from people who don't usually vote your way. And that's where we have a very important and uh, it'll be a swiftly vanishing window at the national level to get stuff done and just show people uh, what it means for us to actually have the the tools of government aligned in a way that are gonna make them better off. And that can go a long way toward cutting through some of the bad faith arguments and misinformation that we know is flying around out there. Thanks so much, Bob. And in the last couple of minutes we have, let us turn to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, Mayor Lirian Gaylord Baird. Uh, you're mute. That better? You got me? All right. Thank you, Debbie. Pete, it's so nice to see you. Thank you so much for what you gave to our country with your candidacy. And it's been fun to watch you in the months since go viral, finding common ground with people who are even disruptive in uh, rallies that you served as a surrogate for President-elect Biden. So thank you for everything you've done for our country and for us at New Deal. Um, Joe Biden talks about building back better, 
post pandemic and you as mayor of South Bend, Indiana, you know, took took the reins of a city that had been economically devastated in the manufacturing sector in particular and you were instrumental in turning around that economy and community. What lessons did you learn from that experience that we should be thinking about as we look to rebuild our communities that have been so hard hit by the pandemic and its economic impacts, particularly throughout the Midwest? So first of all, thanks for, for uh, your encouragement and support, and thanks for, for what you're doing to lead your, your community. It's been really fun to watch you uh, through the years uh, and, and, and see you uh, take charge and, and deliver as a fellow uh, blue mayor in a red place, uh, getting stuff done and, and, and earning a lot of credibility as you go. So uh, it's, it's good to be reunited. You know, in my first campaign uh, for mayor, it was like a five-way race. And one of the turning points was during a debate when we got a question about what, what you would do as mayor if our city got hit by an F5 tornado that just tore right through downtown and destroyed everything in its path. And as folks went down the line answering, I began to realize and then answered in a way that I was kind of thinking out loud that that had already happened to our city, except it hadn't happened in the form of a tornado. It happened in slow motion and then it happened in the form of an economic uh, collapse. But what happened, even in its physical uh, uh, effects, was not that different from a natural disaster. And uh, realizing that helped set the tone for my campaign and ultimately for my administration, which was not about nostalgia, it was not about wallowing in some sense of glory days that we had to recover. It was about what comes next. And I think the first lesson was shaking off the idea that we were just going to turn around and go back to what we had. It was actually really important. This is, this is the greatest falsehood in Make America Great Again. It's the idea that there's some kind of again in the real world that we can just go back to. Uh, never mind that that, that, that uh, prior state wasn't, wasn't great for a lot of folks. It's one of the things I really appreciate about the president-elect's uh, language of build back better. It's not build back what we had. It's not build back to uh, where everything's were before we face these challenges. Build back better. I'll give you another example. Um, the, the office where I work now, where my I have a little faculty office uh, for uh, up in Notre Dame where I'm a fellow. And the building I was in was built with great fanfare in the early 90s as one of the first on campus, I think on any campus, to be hardwired so that there was a Cat5 internet ethernet cable going to every single room in that building. Uh, they wanted it to be state of the art. Uh, the internet was coming to be really important. And so at great expense and with great effort, they had an exceptionally wired building on which they cut the ribbon just a couple of years before Wi-Fi became really important. And every time I look at the little Wi-Fi repeater over the door as I uh, leave the office, I, I think about how sometimes there can actually be an opportunity in the building on the devastation of the past to, to think anew. Because now when you're building a building, you don't have to worry about putting all those old wires through it to have Internet. And I think we should bear that metaphor in mind a lot, too. This is not about reconstructing meticulously whatever it is we, we feel we just lost. This is about figuring out how the very real resources and attributes from work ethic to the social capital to sometimes just the abundance of land uh, that, that our communities have that are different from the assets and resources that are dominant in, in an environment like a Silicon Valley or, or, uh, or most coastal cities. But if, if connected up in the right way are the stuff of enormous growth and potential. And then communicate, and this is another example of one of those soft things that we policy-minded people sometimes lose sight of, just communicate a sense of faith and belief in what that community can do. The policy stuff, if you're elected, people already believe that you know what you're saying, <laughs> what you're talking about on the policy stuff. And, and, and uh, you know, this is a, a place to this new deal is a space to geek out on the policy things that I consider most exciting from wastewater technology to, uh, uh, to rural broadband. But across all of that, right, there's something else that you can do that, that, that we should never forget the importance of. And that's just uh, talking about how much you believe in a place in a way that, that, that authenticates or validates other people starting to do the same. And if you can pull that off, and that's one of the most important things that happened in South Bend. The one thing I can't actually count or prove, but I can just tell you happened, was people realizing that it was okay and eventually even sort of counterculturally cool 
to identify with this project in a sort of local militant patriotism, this project of bringing our community forward. And that's something that I think we need to tap into more than ever, given the, the clear eyed sense of what we're up against economically, atmospherically and morally in our communities going into the 2020s. Great, thank you so much, Mayor. And thank you, uh, Mayor Pete, it, you know, again, just for your, your friendship, your partnership with New Deal, your leadership with us in, in this country. It is um, remarkable to see your rise and we are so proud of you and so grateful to have you be part of this uh, of this movement. So thank you. And I will remind everyone who's watching that trust, um, our best chance would make a great stocking stuffer for Christmas. So let's make sure you get those, you get those uh, purchased as soon as possible. So thank you. Thank you again for being with us. It's now my great pleasure to turn to uh, my partner in crime, uh, our visionary fierce uh, founder and board chair of New Deal, uh, Helen Milby. Thank you, Debbie, so much. I'm so excited about this week's conference and a huge um, just thank you to you, the team, the supporters, the allies, and most especially the leaders and our alums, especially the alum after seeing the great uh, Mayor Pete just do those inspiring words. And I think I heard a little Buddy or Truman in the background, so it was kind of fun to get reminded of what a great, um, you know, just amazing person he and Tastin are and just how great they are to be around. It's gonna be a great few days. We couldn't be more proud of this work and we are ready to get going. So um, to kick this off quickly, we're gonna just get a couple cameo um, visits from friends and allies who have done amazing things. The first I'm really excited to introduce is Aaron Wilson. Um, I think many of you, especially the New Deal leaders out there probably worked um, directly with Aaron over the many months. Uh, she was the campaign's national political director. Huge congratulations to her for a job very, very well done. Um, and bless her, she's now pivoting immediately to January 20th, and she is going to be the deputy executive director of the inauguration um, committee. So a big thank you to Aaron for making time to join us tonight. Excited for that. I'm going to turn it over to you for a few words. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for those kind words. And thank you so much to the New Deal leaders. Um, we would not be where we are today without the, the partnership and the support uh, from so many of you all across the nation. And I do want to just take a quick second to say happy birthday. Uh, 10 years is such, uh, such a strong achievement. And uh, what an amazing legacy to have built and to continue to build as we look forward. We campaigned on a strong partnership between elected officials at every level of government. And there is no doubt that New Deal Leaders is a huge piece of that. And one of the greatest joys of my and my time, um, and I served as national political director from the launch in 2019, in the spring of 2019, uh, all the way up until uh, a week or so ago when I accepted this, this new role to help lead the inaugural activities. I was, I was thrilled and privileged to have the opportunity to travel the nation and uh, when we were able to travel more openly and get to meet so many of our next generation of leaders of which New Deal leaders are a huge piece of that. And it's been so exciting to see uh, and promote throughout the campaign and my expectations we will continue to see that throughout a Biden-Harris administration, the various ways that we can learn from each other and work to continue to fight for the battle of the soul of the nation and to pull us forward within these, these challenging times that we currently find ourselves in. So thank you, thank you so much. And now the hard work begins because now we have a lot of work to do uh, as we look towards the next uh, the next four years and, and hopefully beyond of an administration. And then we have about 50 some days until we um, get to inaugurate our president elect and vice president elect. And I'm sure folks here are looking for the details. And what I can tell you is we know that this inauguration is going to look very different amid the pandemic, but we are going to honor the American inaugural traditions and engage Americans across the country while keeping everyone safe and healthy. And I think that you can expect this historic inauguration to serve as the launching pad for what the Biden-Harris administration will do on day one, uh, which is uh, working towards beating the pandemic, building back our economy better, and uniting our country. So uh, for updates on what to expect and how to be involved and where things are heading, uh, make sure you visit our website, which we launched on Monday, bidenaugural.org. Uh, that's bidenaugural.org. And I'm looking forward to celebrating uh, this beautiful moment as a nation in January. 
And thank you again, Helen, and happy anniversary. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you making time, Erin, in the middle of all of this, and we are there to support you in any way we can. So just count on us anytime. Now I am gonna turn it over to, um, to Congresswoman Susan Del Bene. It's a real honor for me to be introducing her as this. First time I've got the chance to do this as the incoming chair of the House New Democrat Coalition. A really, really important role, especially looking at what uh, the country is gonna be doing as Erin as just referred to, the, the, the work of governing. Um, and I can't imagine a better leader for these hundred or so members of Congress to, to work with as they do that. So um, the Congresswoman is one in a million or billion people, entrepreneur, business leader, and a policy geek. So I'm going to turn it over to her right now. Thank you, Helen. Um, thanks for all that you've done for the New Deal and for the New Dems over the years. Um, thanks to your leadership, we're supporting candidates and local leaders who are moving our country forward. And now that we just finished a historic election where voters overwhelmingly called for a return to normalcy, decency, democracy, and leadership, um, we are in a great position, thank goodness. Uh, while the House results were not what we had hoped for, we kept the Democratic majority, and most importantly, we got back the White House. Um, new Dems have been aligned with President-elect Biden throughout the campaign. Many of our members, myself included, um, served as surrogates for the campaign, and we stand ready to work with the new administration in the next Congress. That's because the new Dems, like the New Deal leaders, are about finding pragmatic, innovative solutions to complicated issues. And one of the top things that I hear from my constituents is they want governance to work again. They want to see us get things done. And we have a lot to do after the last four years of gridlock in Congress. That's one of the main reasons that I ran for chair of the new Dems, and I'm excited to lead the coalition into the next Congress. We've been able to commit to finding the best ideas to rebuild our middle class and create opportunities for hardworking families in this new economy. Over the last decade, we've seen our coalition numbers grow, and next Congress will remain the, the largest ideological group of the House Democrats. Our size is a great strength of ours, because when we commit to working together to push for an agenda that provides all Americans economic opportunity and security, we are able to be successful. When asked to describe New Dems to others, I say that we're the ones who want to solve hard policy problems and get to yes. But to really have an impact, Congress must enact laws that solve the problems of today and head off the problems of tomorrow. And we're the group that has to lead that effort. We don't put ideology ahead of what is good for the country. We're willing to look for innovative solutions to address the constantly changing challenges that we face as a country. We might not be the loudest voice in the room, but we're the most pragmatic coalition in Congress and new Dems represent the foundation of the expansion of the Democratic Party outside of the typical urban base that people think of into purple districts like mine uh, that have rural and suburban areas and are key to our holding the majority. My district was called the most evenly divided in the country when it was redrawn back in 2012. It's urban and rural. It goes from the suburbs of Seattle up to the Canadian border. It's a hub of innovation and technology to agriculture and manufacturing. We have communities like struggling timber towns that are trying to build a strong future. It's a microcosm of the country. It's politically divided and home to great wealth and crushing poverty. Um, when I was young in elementary school, my dad lost his job and we traveled all over the country as my parents looked for work. And it was a very tough time, what many families are going through right now. I feel incredibly fortunate that I was able to go to college and get a great education. And that allowed me to have a successful career and take care of my family. And one of the reasons I ran for Congress was because I believe that if I were growing up today, I wouldn't have had the same opportunities to succeed. And that needs to change. We need to work together to build back better. And that starts with facing the economic and public health crises at hand. The Biden national reopening strategy is largely in line with what the New Dem Coalition has long advocated for in a national recovery strategy. So we'll work to hit the ground running with the incoming administration. And as the country navigates the COVID-19 pandemic, we must ensure that everyone, individuals, workers, students, families, small businesses are safe. The next few years will not be easy. 
We have many challenges ahead, but I am confident that new Dems and new deal leaders can bridge the divide and deliver for our country. When it comes to the future of work, climate change, or combating the COVID-19 pandemic, New Deal and New Dem leaders have collaborated a lot already, and I look forward to continuing that. Now, we even enjoy working with New De we enjoy working with New Deal leaders so much that we steal a few for the <laughs> New Dems, like my new colleague from Washington State, Marilyn Strickland. Um, she is my neighbor and friend and the newest member of the Washington State delegation. Marilyn was born in South Korea. She will be the first Asian American to represent Washington State in Congress and one of the first Korean American women elected in our nation's history. As mayor of Tacoma, Washington, she helped transform a city economically crippled by a deep recession into a destination for families, workers, artists, tourists, and entrepreneurs. She attracted over a billion dollars for housing and businesses and invested over 500 million in infrastructure for roads, bridges, transportation, and the port, creating over 40,000 jobs, 40,000 new jobs in the region. Maryland led successful efforts to raise the minimum wage and pass paid sick leave, paving the way for statewide action. Her citywide environmental action plan set goals to improve the air, water, and health for Tacoma's residents. She launched an award-winning summer jobs program for high school students that led to the Tacoma Tide Flats Certification Program, creating a pipeline for students to fill high demand jobs in the maritime and construction trades. And while in office, she raised the high school graduation rate from 55% to 89% by making education a civic priority. Marilyn stood with the LGBTQ community in support of marriage equality and transgender rights and passed background checks for gun sales in Tacoma before statewide action. So that's just some of what Marilyn's done. And so you get to hear from her directly. It's my great pleasure to introduce my new colleague for our Washington State delegation, Congresswoman-elect Marilyn Strickland. Perfect. Better? From New Deal leader to New Dem, from City Hall to the Halls of Congress. Hi everyone, and thank you for letting me be part of this today. I'm here to talk about my experience as mayor of Tacoma, where I was a New Deal leader. And what I liked best about being a New Deal leader was I was with people from around the country who shared a purpose of getting things done for their communities, of having open minds, a willingness to work across the aisle in a bipartisan manner, but again, focusing on the people that we were sent to office to represent. As I think about how being a New Deal leader prepared me for Congress, I'd say there are a few things. There is nothing like serving in local office when it comes to accountability, because you are on the ground with the people that you represent every single day. So when I was making my bid to become a member of Congress, I often talked about accountability doing the work that people send you to DC to do. And that's what my focus is. As we think about the unique times that we are facing, we're in the middle of a pandemic, an economic crisis, and we're dealing with racial injustice in a way that we have not before. Being a New Deal leader has helped prepare me for all those things because you have to collaborate, you have to listen, you have to give people grace, and you always have to be focused on your desired outcome. As we think about what we're facing as a country, we know we need a national strategy to deal with testing, contact tracing, and getting a vaccine out there when something is approved and safe. We know that this economy must be inclusive. And so much of what you do as a New Deal leader is about economic opportunity, economic justice, and prosperity for all. So having been a New Deal leader during my time as mayor of Tacoma, taking those leadership skills to my brief time at the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce, thoroughly prepared me to be in Congress right now. And so I'm honored to be part of the New Democrat Coalition. I'm honored to be an alum of the New Deal Leadership Group. And I tell people that you have opportunities to be around people to help prepare you for what's next. And whatever's next for you, just be ready for it. It could be another elected office. It could be in the private sector. It could be running a nonprofit organization. But whatever you decide to do, the camaraderie, the lessons, and what you get to learn from being a New Deal leader is just something that is so invaluable. So I'm honored to be a New Deal leader sitting in Congress right now. My race was a tough one. I ran on a platform of getting things done because, hey, mayors get things done. 
but I was effective as a mayor because I was a New Deal leader. So thanks for the chance to be here and share a few words with you. And I'm now going to introduce our next speaker. And this is Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who serves as Pennsylvania's Attorney General. He was sworn in in January. He's the Commonwealth's top lawyer and chief law enforcement officer. And through his career as a public servant, Josh has risen above politics and taken on the status quo to protect Pennsylvanians. But here's the thing that I think really exemplifies what it's like to be a New Deal leader. His work has earned him a national reputation as a rising progressive leader and bipartisan consensus builder. Sounds like an oxymoron sometimes, but that's the essence of who we are as New Deal leaders. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Josh. Hey gang, it's good to be with all of you. Um, this is Attorney General Josh Shapiro from Pennsylvania, and I want to thank the Congresswoman-elect for the introduction and to congratulate you, Congresswoman, on your historic election. I also want to give a shout out uh, to my good friend, Mayor Pete, who I know spoke a few minutes ago. Um, he's a, a great leader in our party and someone um, who helped me a lot in my race and has just really been a constant source of, of support and guidance for me, and I know many others. And I know you're going to hear from another good friend of mine, Senator Chris Coons, in just a few moments. Um, I want to just take a few minutes and talk about New Deal's mission, talk a little bit about what happened here in Pennsylvania in 2020, uh, just a few weeks ago, although it seems like it continues to go on, and then share a couple of thoughts on uh, from my race and some of the lessons that I felt we learned uh, in this last cycle. Look, New Deal's mission is obviously to support and connect emerging state and local leaders. And I believe that that is so critical right now. 2020 has taught us many things, and that is that strong leadership is desperately needed at the state and local level to tackle the many challenges that we face. Look, we've seen it all across this country, here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, from California to New York and every place in between. We need state and local leaders to be able to handle the public health challenges of this pandemic, to support struggling workers and families in an economic downturn, to enforce our election laws and much more. These folks have been on the front lines. Their jobs are critical. The election of good, competent people to these jobs are critical. And dare I say, right now, it is a matter of life or death in terms of who sits in these positions. At the same time that we've seen the rise of state and local leaders in meeting these challenges, we've also seen a, sh a sharp decline in people's faith in our system of government that has largely been driven by the lies coming from President Donald Trump, our sitting president, and his enablers, of which there are many all across this country. So while all of us have known that our job is to really be the backbone of government, it's now on us to go a step further and prove to our constituents that we are not just up to the job that we've been elected to, but that we are up to the tall task of restoring faith in our systems of government. Look, as Pennsylvania's attorney general, I've always been guided by the principle that it's my job to be the lawyer for the people, not for the powerful institutions. I'm proud of the fact that people call me the people's AG here in Pennsylvania. And because that, I've tried to take on the biggest fights, uncovering hundreds of predator priests and thousands of child victims and a conspiracy and cover up in the Catholic Church here in Pennsylvania that stretched all the way to the Vatican. And thanks to our work, survivors now have their voice back and their truth has been heard. We took on two of the largest health insurance companies in the entire country to make sure that two and a half million Western Pennsylvanians 
had access to health care. We stood up to the fracking companies who were literally poisoning our water and harming families. And we've been unafraid to take on any powerful interest, including the president of the United States, who I've taken to court more than two dozen times. And when we take this president to court, we win. And of course, over the last few months, we have taken on maybe the biggest fight of all, and that is protecting our democracy, our voting rights, and the integrity of our election here in Pennsylvania as it's been under attack by the sitting president and his enablers. Well, I'm proud to tell you that Pennsylvania's election results have been certified. And we have beaten Donald Trump's lawyers, Rudy Giuliani and all the others in court, literally dozens of times to protect the will of the people here in Pennsylvania. And while I've been particularly busy defending and protecting our election and our election laws, I do want you to know that I'm a proud New Dealer who just got reelected to my second term as Pennsylvania's top lawyer. And just as we did back in my first race in 2016, we proved that our brand of bold, reformist, progressive leadership can actually appeal across geographic and party lines. Let me give you a few data points to back that up. Here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, a state with 13 million people, Joe Biden bested Donald Trump by 80,000 votes. At the same time, I won by over 300,000 votes. And I will tell you, it was a rough year for Democrats in Pennsylvania. We lost nearly every competitive legislative race. My two fellow state row officers, the treasurer and the auditor general, both lost. I was proud that we were able to overperform the presidential ticket, particularly in areas in working communities like Pittsburgh and Scranton and the more rural parts of the Commonwealth. And I'm confident that we had the success because Pennsylvanians understood our record of good, competent, results-oriented government. That's what we've tried to give them. And I think it's a lesson for all of us, for all New Dealers and those who are aspiring and those who are already in office, that we have to be bold about our vision and our values and be unafraid to take on the big fights. Voters want to vote for someone that they feel has their back and has their interests in mind and can actually deliver for them. And that's what we've tried to do. Look, I'll just say this uh, in closing. Our country faces so many challenges right now. And obviously, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are up to the task, and they'll do an extraordinary job digging us out from the hole that our sitting president created. Thankfully, we have new leadership that can do that in Washington. But as I said earlier, it's on all of us in the states, in the counties, in the cities to do our part. And right now, so much of that task falls to us to help not just do the jobs we were elected to do, but to really unify this country, to bring people together, to give them faith in our institutions again. I am so proud to be a part of the New Dealers. I'm proud to be a part of the success over the last decade of New Dealers. And I'm proud to be in this fight with all of you. I'm grateful for your service. I'm grateful for the sacrifices that you're making in communities all across this great country. And I wanna thank you for having me here tonight and look forward to our ongoing work together. Stay safe, everybody. And I hope to see you in person real soon. My name is Constance Milstein, AKA Connie, AKA Godmother to my dear friends, Debbie Cox Bolton and Helen Milby, because I was also an originator of New Deal. It all started one evening in my home in January of 2009. We resolved that night that we would create an organization focused on encouraging community, state, and local leaders to reach for the stars and elevate their political aspirations. Tonight, I have the honor to introduce Senator Chris Coons, a man of special presence, a trusted colleague and confidant of President-elect Joe Biden. Chris is the epitome of everything we search for in a leader at New Deal. Hi, it is so great to be with you this evening. I'm Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. 
Um, and I just got to hear a remarkable introduction from Connie Milstein. And I am so thrilled to be joining such great leaders all over our country, New Deal leaders from states and communities, from counties and cities that are going to be the backbone of the recovery of our nation that I'm excited to play some small part in here in the Senate and across our country. Some of you may know that I'm on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Appropriations Committee, um, that I represent Delaware in the same seat that was held for 36 years by our president-elect Joe Biden, and that I've had the blessing of serving alongside Vice President-elect Kamala Harris uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee. But what you may not all know is that being part of a group just like New Deal leaders, the DLC Fellows, was an absolutely critical turning point in my public service career. Some of the folks who I got to know from those days are literally with us tonight. So to newly elected state Senator Lorraine Owsley, great to see you. To Michael Blake, state representative from New York and a great companion on the campaign trail this year, great to be with you. And to my successor as county executive in Newcastle County, Matt Meyer, it's so good to be with you tonight. I wish I were there in person. I wish we were all together in person because when I've had a chance to go to a New Deal event over the last decade, while I've been here in the United States Senate, I inevitably get recharged and re-energized about how important the work is that you do day in and day out. When I was a young, newly elected county council president and county executive in Newcastle County, Delaware, I really struggled to find great role models, folks who could give me advice and insight, who could encourage and sustain me in my work in local government. Because while it's important and it's urgent and you get lots of direct feedback from your constituents, it's sometimes lonely and challenging. I found that through the DLC fellows and I found that through the other local elected officials who I got to bond with through weekends just like this one, through days and evenings together. So I hope those of you who are joining this evening, maybe for the first time or who've been with us for a longer period, recognize what a special community this is. Connie was convinced to invest in creating New Deal leaders after the experience of DLC Fellows, because those of us who'd been a part of that experience told her it was literally the most valuable thing we'd ever done in public service. And when I was running for the first time for the US Senate in 2010, it was folks like those I just mentioned and many others on this call and throughout the country who helped encourage and sustain me. It was the folks I stayed up with late at night to talk about campaign strategy and the folks who took my calls in the middle of long drives up and down my state when I said, why am I doing this? There's no chance I'm gonna win. Well, at the end of the day, after what's been a very long and challenging campaign season here in 2020, all of us won. Because with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House, we are gonna have a chance to genuinely turn the page on the era of President Trump and Trumpism. On the Foreign Relations Committee, I've been spending time over the last two years studying the very real challenge to free and open societies posed by China and their commitment to expanding their capacity for digital authoritarianism on the world stage. Yes, that was an abrupt shift to talking about foreign policy, but I'll bring it all back together in just a few minutes. As someone who has been concerned about our place in the world for the decade that I've served on the Foreign Relations Committee, and as someone who's visited 80 countries around the world in my role as a US Senator, I am more convinced than ever that the world wants and needs and welcomes American leadership of the kind that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will provide as president and vice president. But more than anything else, and Joe has said this on the campaign trail over and over, what the world needs to see is that democracy can actually work. What the American people need to see is that democracy can actually work. Mayor Pete talked about the erosion of trust the loss of confidence in each other, in our institutions, and in the possibility of solving our problems that's at the very core of what catapulted an obscure and unlikely candidate, Donald Trump, from being the punchline of late night TV show jokes to being president of the United States in, 19, in, excuse me, in 2016. And it's that erosion of trust, of confidence in each other that he has simply accelerated, cracked wider open over the last four years. When I first sat down with Joe Biden to talk about his running for president and to persuade him that he was the right man for this moment, neither of us could have known that 2020 
would be the incredible, challenging, difficult, at times awful year that it has been. Neither of us knew that there was a global pandemic on the horizon. Neither of us knew that there'd be a tragic recession as a result of Donald Trump's bungled mishandling of the response to that pandemic. And certainly neither of us knew that there'd be a horrific murder of an African-American man at the hands of the police of Minneapolis halfway through the year. And that as a result, tens of millions of Americans would take to the streets to demand that we address racial inequality and injustice. But I knew that Joe Biden would be the right person, the right leader to help us through these challenges in this moment. That the combination of his deep optimism, his confidence in you and in all of us as Americans, and the ways in which he's come through really awful experiences, both at the beginning of his career in public service when he tragically lost his wife and daughter just before Christmas, to the tragic loss of his son, Bo, his beloved son, a veteran and our attorney general in Delaware. Here's what unites all of us in this experience and is why Joe, I think, can help lead us forward. Even having overcome those tragedies and those losses, Joe remains optimistic. He remains confident that democracy can deliver real solutions. He can look at the Senate in which I serve, where Mitch McConnell is the majority leader and say, I believe we can still find a way together to address the problems facing our country. So folks, in this coming year on the global stage, we have a chance to restore our global leadership by actually delivering a global response to this pandemic through the vaccines that we've largely fund the development of. If we don't forget to not just take care of our own people, but to lead on the world stage, to rejoin the World Health Organization, to join with all of our allies in the organization known as COVAX and to distribute vaccines, not just here in America, but to the world. We have an opportunity in Glasgow next fall at the COP26 gathering to not just rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, but to show real leadership on the world stage in combating climate change. But neither of those are global engagement and our challenge to China for them to be leaders in combating climate change or our global engagement and our challenge to China to be real leaders in confronting the pandemic. None of that will really matter. None of that will really transform our place in the world to where it was and should be again if democracy doesn't work at home. The crises that we were facing before the pandemic, opioid addiction, a lack of confidence in each other, an increase in the cost of living and a loss in quality jobs for middle Americans. All of that still stands in front of us. And you're the people who actually deliver innovations, solutions, results as mayors, as state senators and state representatives, as members of city councils, as county executives like Matt, who's doing an amazing job at leading the response to this pandemic in Newcastle County, Delaware today. You're actually delivering the results that give people confidence that democracy can work. I wish I could tell you that it is Congress that's actually delivering the bold and the broad and the unanimous response to this pandemic that we deserve. But it was. The CARES Act, which I'll remind you, we passed now nine months ago, was passed unanimously by the Senate of the United States. And it was the single biggest bill I'll ever vote for. It was $2.3 trillion dollars. That was one of the most inspiring moments I've had in the Senate. And right now, a bipartisan group of us are working through the night to try and deliver another round of that. But the reality is, you're the folks who are taking those resources and delivering real solutions that are actually helping, helping families, helping schools, helping folks in skilled nursing facilities, helping hospitals, helping clinics. So let me just close by saying how inspired I am by you, by your example of what you do day in and day out. There's a good friend of mine who's the mayor of St. Pete, Rick Kreisman, who was going to be part of this call tonight, but is busy responding to a genuine crisis that's unfolding in St. Petersburg because of an officer involved shooting. We've been texting throughout the evening, and it's a reminder to me of what all of you represent. Folks who stand up, who serve, who deliver solutions, who work across the aisle, and who build back better trust in democracy. So thanks for letting me be a small part of this evening. I so look forward to the time when we can be together in person again. 
I know that you've got an unbelievable agenda for the next two days, jam-packed with inspiring opportunities to connect with each other and to talk about how we're gonna deliver these real solutions. But I hope you know that Joe Biden, someone who started his career as a county councilman, has never forgotten how important local elected officials are to delivering real results. And in a two hour conversation he and I had just a week ago about how we're gonna deal with China on the world stage, we literally came back to you, to the importance of showing that democracy works at the local level so we can rebuild trust, we can rebuild confidence, and we can rebuild our place on the world stage. Thanks for who you are, thanks for what you do, and I know that you will find inspiration and encouragement and answers and colleagues for the journey in these next two days. Thanks, and have a great conference. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, so always so great to have you with us, and we so appreciate your leadership and your uh, you're just a beacon of light. And frankly, this whole night has been. I mean, I'm I'm leaving, gonna leave tonight, just feeling so much better. I'm gonna feel like I can exhale finally. Um, that we uh, have such brighter days ahead of us. I'm gonna. Uh, pun intended, pluck a comment out from our friend uh, on the chat. Uh, former New Deal leader Andrew Platt, a New Deal board member, said, listening to New Deal leaders is like political chicken soup for the soul. I think that is a great uh, comment I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elevate, and, um, and you were certainly a big part of that, so thank you for being with us tonight. I also want to go ahead and thank, of course, um, Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro, uh, the Congresswoman Del Bene, and Strickland, uh, Aaron Wilson and Mayor Pete Buttigieg uh, for being with us to kick off this amazing three days that we're going to experience together. And then I also just want to thank every single person on this call, whether you are a New Deal leader, you are a supporter, a friend, an ally of the New Deal, we're going to need you. We have uh, appreciated your support and your engagement for the last 10 years as we look to celebrate our 10th uh, conference this year. We're going to need you even more going forward. So thank you for being with us. Um, we are going to reconvene tomorrow at 11 a.m., uh, um, Eastern, uh, back here on the big stage to talk about some of those uh, dire but important uh, challenges that we face together, uh, from the pandemic to the rebuilding the economy and to racial injustice. So we look forward to having you there. Be here uh, 11 o'clock Eastern. And again, thank you for being with us tonight. Good night.